Well, we survived the High Holy Days. <laughs> so now what? On Sukkot, as Cantor Kadrain reminded us, we read the book of Kohelet, which instructs us that there is an appointed time for everything. Or if you're a Birds fan, that for everything there is a season. We made it through the month of Elul, which is the time for taking an account of our souls. And through Rosh Hashanah, which is a time for remembering the creation of the world and setting an intention for the new year. And through Yom Kippur, which is a time for confessing our sins and acknowledging our mortality. So now what? What is this time for? It's a time for building. Yom Kippur is known as Shabbat Shabbaton, the Shabbat of all Shabbats, where we not only stop working, we stop doing everything, so that even if for one day we acknowledge that we are not in control. But once the gates close at Na'ila and we make Havdalah, the first thing we are supposed to do, even before we eat our bagel, is to drive the first nail into our sukkah. This teaches us not to revel in our self-reflection beyond its appointed time, but instead to get to work, to move from an acknowledgement of life's fragility to taking the first step to creating the structure in which we will rejoice not in spite of the fact that life is fleeting, but because life is fleeting. And we are aware that this moment is all that we have. Between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, you'll hear people greeting each other with Gemar Hatima Tova. Gemar means to complete something. Hatima means a seal, like a wax seal. And Tova means good. And so this greeting translates roughly to, may you complete this process of repentance by being sealed for a good year. Sometimes we shorten this to Gemar Tov. May it end well for you. May your teshuva be complete. You might assume that we stop greeting each other this way once the gates of repentance close at the end of Yom Kippur. But no. Actually, we get to keep saying Gemar Tov all the way through the end of Sukkot. Because although the Book of Life is written on Rosh Hashanah and sealed on Yom Kippur, it is not sent through the divine mail until the end of Sukkot. But we've already confessed. We've already repented and fasted. What more is there to do to complete our teshuva? What are we supposed to do between now and the end of Sukkot? What is this a time for? This time is for picking up a hammer and getting to work. My guess, my hope, is that at some point during the High Holy Days, there was a moment when you decided you wanted to live differently this year. Maybe you wrote it in, down in your little blue book of life. And if so, I hope that your dog did not try to then eat the book like mine did, celebrating dogs. <laughs> But whether in this book or a journal or just in your heart, there must have been one moment where you decided to change how you lived. And then we blew the sh shofar and we made Havdalah and you went back to work and you caught up on your email. And maybe that intention that was so vivid for that moment is already starting to fade. Well, now it's time to return to that intention, to pick up the hammer and drive the first nail into the work that you have set for yourself. To take that first small concrete step toward who you want to be. So we're going to take a minute and get down to brass tacks. I want you to think about that intention. No, really, I'll wait. Got it? What's the first step you need to take? And when this week will you take it? Maybe like me, you've fallen out of touch with your friends. When this week will you reach out? If you have your calendar, take it out and write it down. If not, write yourself a note. 
Maybe inspired by Rabbi Rosenthal and Rabbi Lorge's sermons, you were determined that you wanted to channel your righteous prophetic anger to make sure that we never return to the world as it was. What will you do this week to make that happen? Attend a phone bank training or give money to a food pantry? What is the very first step and when will you do it? Maybe you recognized you needed to take better care of your body and resolve to exercise or address your reliance on drugs or alcohol. What's the first step toward making that happen? Finding a walking buddy? Making a call to your sponsor? When this week will you do that? I don't know what you resolve to do in your heart, but you do. What's the promise that you made yourself? What's the first tiny nail you need to drive into the structure that will support you living a fuller and more joyous and meaningful life this year? And when will you do it? Our Torah portion for Sukkot, not surprisingly, includes the commandment to observe the holiday. You shall dwell in Sukkot for seven days so that future generations will know that I caused the Israelites to dwell in Sukkot when I brought them out of Egypt, says God. The rabbis of the Talmud, also not surprisingly, disagree about what this means. Why is it so important to remember that the Israelites dwelled in Sukkot? Rabbi Eliezer says God wasn't talking about literal Sukkot, but rather the clouds of God's presence that descended upon the Israelites as they wandered through the desert. But if it's the clouds, why remember it specifically on Sukkot? Our tradition suggests an answer connected to another structure that the Israelites built in the wilderness, the Mishkan, or portable sanctuary. According to one Midrash, God's instruction to Moses to build the Mishkan was given right after the incident with the golden calf on Yom Kippur. And following this instruction, people began bringing all kinds of donations to help with the building effort, Think of this as the very first Yom Kippur appeal. Mm -hmm. Now this went on for days until Moses had to tell them to stop so they could actually get going with the construction project. And then on Sukkot, five days after the instructions were first handed down on Yom Kippur, construction began. And when that happened, the clouds of God's presence settled among the people. That is the experience that we remember on Sukkot. What's important here is that God's presence doesn't settle among the people when they write their checks for the Yom Kippur appeal. Although for those of you who have, thank you very, very much. And God doesn't wait to make the divine presence known until the Mishkan is complete, which isn't until the spring. Instead, that sense of divine connection occurs when the people take that first concrete step to replace the golden calf with a structure that will allow God to dwell among them in community. This last bit is great news for us. We don't have to wait until we've completed our work to tap into that sense of healing and connection that comes from teshuva. Because we know that for some of the things that we are struggling with, the work may not be done in our lifetime. All it takes to make our teshuva complete is to drive that first nail, to take the first step towards wholeness. Tonight is Shabbat. It is a time to pause and reflect and accept the world as it is. But tomorrow, once we make Havdalah, it will be a time for building. May your teshuva be complete. May it end well for you and for all of us. Gamar Tov.